of implementing and understanding empirical phenomena. Now, there are scientists, and the vast majority, if not all, I wouldn't say all, but the vast majority of contemporary scientists um, are materialist, physicalist scientists, meaning that all they believe that exists in the world is empirical phenomena. It's a mat, and I'll talk about this later, but all that exists is matter. It's all material. We are nothing different than a rock insofar as we are both material. The only distinction between us and the rock is this notion of consciousness. And contemporary scientists are even doing away with that conception of consciousness. They talk more about sort of synaptic dendritic firings and blah, blah, blah. Right? So um, we can use science to make sense of empirical phenomena. What the occultist wants to do is to say that this is valid, right? The occultist is not saying that science isn't a valid tool for assessing and coming to understand the truths of our existence. But what the occultist is saying is that it's not the only tool for understanding our existence, right? That there exists, and I'll draw it like this, maybe, just so you have a sense, right? So just imagine the same object in a different sense. There are non-empirical Right? There are non-empirical phenomena, and we can use uh, occult or esoteric practices to come to understand and interpret these non-empirical phenomena. And we'll talk about this um, in a little bit. Not to get too heady, too quickly, but just one immediate... Well, actually, no, I won't, I won't, I won't jump. I won't jump ahead. But, so, the occultist is um, merely saying, listen, it's not exclusively devil worship, though there are segments of the occult that do practice devil worshiping. The occult in general, sort of as a theory, remember we're approaching this theoretically, we're trying to understand and assess what it is the nature of this thing is, so that we can better interact or defend ourselves or engage or whatever it might be that we want to do with respect to the knowledge that we've acquired. And so occultism pertains to the esoteric study of the relationship between human consciousness and non-empirical phenomena. That's sort of my summation. There's lots more that can go into that, but I think that covers most of it. The second point, the second point is that occultist theory serves, someone might say, as a, a misconception of the occult. They'd say, well, okay, I'll, I'll give you that, right? That, okay, occultist theory is not necessarily interested in empirical verification. They're more interested in um, to be technical, an epistemological, theoretical way of knowing. Um, an epistemological account of non-empirical um, existence. I'll grant you that, but the misconception could still be occultist theories serve no contemporary significance, and since they don't serve a contemporary significance, they're, use they're useless, right? So, okay, fine, there is these various esoteric orders and sects and cults, um, and then that, that's all well and good, and they're all trying to arrive at some understanding of non-empirical phenomenon. But what does it have to do with me paying my light bill? <laughs> what does it have to be, do with me, you know, finishing my education or, or taking care of my family? Um, there's no practical implication for occult theories in a contemporary world, which is a very good critique, right? We, there might have been, in a previous time, alchemy and such, and astrology, there might have been a time in which, prior to chemistry, prior to astronomy, there was a need for alchemy and astronomy, but now, in a um, post-enlightenment era, where we have chemistry and astronomy, why would we regress back to alchemy and astrology, for example, right? So, there's no longer a need for occultist theory. And, again, I want to say that that's false, right? So, there's no need for occultist uh, and I want to say that's false. Immediately, that shows bias. I obviously feel that there is a need for occultist theory. I want to qualify that again. This, is, this isn't to say that um, I'm endorsing or not endorsing the occult. What I am saying is that it is a theoretical way of interpreting our reality. And like any theoretical approach to um, a discourse on our interpretation of reality, I think there should be um, grounds in which those views, those beliefs, those ideologies can be espoused. Um, and investigated if possible. Um, with respect to the occult, um, that's false to say that there are no theoretical, um, no, no contemporary applications for the occult. Um, let me put this down. So I'll give a few examples. The first, Descartes' uh, discussion, for those of you who've read the meditations, um, you'll know what I'm talking about. 
Descartes' discussion of the function of the pineal gland and the meditations has occultist, occultist roots. I'm not going to discuss Descartes' discussion of the pineal gland and the function. Just take my word for it that his discourse on the pineal gland and its function in the meditations, look it up in the meditations, it has occultist roots. Spinoza's um, pantheistic metaphysics has occultist roots, right? Spinoza talks um, through a very sort of regimented, logical, axiomatic discourse, phenomenal text, um, about the relationship between I and um, the Godhead, and he sees, basically in the conclusion, God in everything, right? He, he, he espouses this pantheism, that pantheistic conception in which God is infused in non-animate, or inanimate, rather, objects, is and has its roots in occult, occultist theory. Granted, this is not to say that Descartes was an occultist, or Spinoza was a cultist, or Leibniz was an occultist, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, um, there is a sense in which either they encountered, or they had some understanding of the occultist and esoteric uh, theoretical tradition, and incorporated some of those concepts into their, into their, um, into their uh, uh, philosophies, right? Again, I'm not saying that they're occultists, I am saying, however, that, and I don't think this is a big conspiracy theory, right? It's not like, this lecture isn't like, oh, there's some big secret society, spooky boogeyman out there that's trying to rule the world. It's not, like, I'm, like, you guys should grant me enough to know that that's not what I'm talking about. What I am saying, however, is that there is an alternative method of making sense of our existence day to day. And it's that alternative method that influences and has impact on the way that we perceive and come to understand the world, right? So if you're interested, there's another way of coming to understand the world. And it's false to say that it's all devil worshipping, right? It's not all devil worshipping. Um, the next thing was uh, Leibniz's, right? Leibniz's monadology and the concept of the monad um, has occultist roots. He gets this, um, he doesn't really get it, but this concept really is sort of explicitly stated in Plato's Parmenides, which I'll discuss and cite below. Um, later in the in the discourse, I did my, um, in 05, in 05, yeah, in 05 I finished my uh, master's degree, and I did my master's on antiquity. I, at the time I was really good with my ancient, I could at the time read um, fairly well um, ancient Greek. Um, I'm really, really rusty now, I'm, I haven't practiced in years, but I was reading traditional, uh, the, the text in the original, and um, methodically, slowly, slowly, very slowly going through and trying to make the translations and make sense of the information as best as I could. So I read primary text, the author and the fragments themselves, and I read secondary accounts of those translations and so on. Um, uh, and I recognized that a lot of these concepts were borrowed throughout history. And um, Leibniz's concept of the monad and his monadology is in some sense indebted to. I'm not saying that it is, right? I don't want all the philosophy fanatics to, you know, critique me on this. But is 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 um, tenuously indebted to uh, Plato's Parmenides and the concept of the one, and oneness, and so on. And I'll discuss that in a little bit. That idea of the one, oneness, one that is all, all that is one, I that is we, he that is she, all of this sort of philosophical blah, 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 what are those philosophers talking about? That is, in, in, in a sense, esoteric occultists, right? So it, there are roots in the occult. And I'm not telling you anything that hasn't been published. All the information that I'm presenting has already been out there for you know hundreds of years in some cases, thousands, you know, millennia in, in some cases. What I'm doing is um, you know, 10 years worth of research since 02, this is about 02, so it's about nine years worth of research, um, you know, consolidated all of that into this one lecture. Um, so I'm, you know, this, this comes from, from my entire graduate education worth of uh, research. Um, the next thing is I can't bullet point number three. So just quickly to go back, the occult a misconception is that the occult is only about devil worship. There are segments of the occult that pertain to devil worship, but not all of the occult is about devil worship. So that's that's partially false. Some sects of the occult pertains to devil worship. Some sects of the occult do not pertain to devil worship. There isn't anything that we should be concerned with, like oh, because some sects pertain to devil worship, I can't do any of that, because there are Christians and there are Muslims. And then there are fundamentalist extremist Christians, and there are fundamentalist extremist Muslims, right? And they use their fundamentalist ideologies in order to justify violence against other people. Um, we don't then say we're going to discard all of Christianity or discard all of Islamic faith 
because uh, a very minute sect 